Chapter Five. Lime pie, very pretty, and the lime flower is sweet. Sang Rachel as the server placed a slice of Joe's famous key lime pie in front of her. Again, the server shook her head, confused. She served the other three women their pie, and then a slice of the deep dish apple pie in front of Linda. I can't believe you are not having the famous key lime pie, Linda. Never been a fan of key lime pie, Linda said. Besides, look at this pie. Debbie spoke with a mouthful of whipped cream and pie. Mmm, this is heaven. So, Rachel, you were the scorekeeper. Who got the most points? I think since Julie did all of the ordering, she had the most chances. But that's okay. Well, you're right. She had the most chances, and except for the first try, she got a point on every single one. Rachel stuffed another bite of the pie in her mouth. She figured out the trick after the first try. I did. What was the trick? Julie asked innocently. You mean you really didn't know? Linda was asking sarcastically. If you have young servers, always use old songs or classics. If you have older servers, use hip hop lyrics. Rachel let out another one of her obnoxious guffaws. Nobody around them seemed to notice. They had taken so long to eat. Most of the tables near them were empty, cleared away, and already set for the next day. This time, when she snorted, whipped cream came out of her nose, and they all started laughing uncontrollably. Oh my God! Started Debbie. You're such a pig. That reminds me of Songfest at camp. That time we were the first ones in the mess hall for banana splits and had that whipped cream fight. I forget. Were we still campus then, or were we student counselors? We were student counselors. That's why we got in so much trouble. Answered Beth. Don't you remember? Don took the golf cart up the hill, so he was the first one to come in, and he caught us right in the middle of it. You should be setting a better example, young ladies. Beth started laughing again, and then he took one of the cans and sprayed all of us. He was such a good guy. He made us clean it all up, but appreciated the fact that it was good, clean fun. I love Don. Me too. Me three. And I make four, said Rachel. He was every girl's dad at that camp. He had a way of making us all feel good about ourselves, but ran the place with an iron hand. My dad could have learned a lot from him. Camp. It was such an amazing place. It wasn't a co-ed camp. Julie couldn't imagine going for a whole summer with just a bunch of snobby Jewish girls. She had a hard time growing up in an upscale Jewish neighborhood. She had never had a strong sense of self-confidence, and she was always a target for bullying. She got picked on incessantly because she didn't have the latest styles, and her parents didn't drive the fanciest cars. Her few friends were more like her, also victims of the clique. Most of her other friends were the nerdy boys who were also afraid of those girls. Nope, just girls. It gave us all a chance to be ourselves without the pressure of being around the boys. There was no competition for boyfriends such as they were when we were ten. Linda tried to explain it. We made lifelong friends, as you can see, because we could be close without having anything come between us, and we all keep in touch with so many more friends from camp. And since Facebook, it has been nothing short of amazing. We've been able to reconnect with so many more. That sounds so nice. I wish I had that. Julie really was a little envious of what these four women had. She kept in touch with one or two friends from high school, and most of the friends she had now were very superficial. There are a few couples that Morty and I see only rarely these days. That we befriended while the kids were growing up, but now nobody seems to have time for us. Probably because they don't like to be around me. I'm such a stick in the mud, and I absolutely hate his doctor friends. Mainly because of their snotty wives, or worse, the new trophy wives. The older women have had more plastic surgery, so that their real features are hardly recognizable, and the trophy wives are beautiful, nubile young things who have no idea what's going on in the world. Rachel had cleaned her nose up and was unusually quiet now. She had put her fork down on her pie plate, and her hands were crossed over each other in front of her plate. Hey, Rage, what's in your head? Linda could read people so easily, and Rachel was particularly easy because she was always animated. You got quiet quickly. I was just thinking about Don. 
It's been over a year since he passed away. You know, even though we haven't seen him in years, I still feel like I lost part of my own family. I think of him all the time. Julie noticed that Rachel's eyes were reddening and tears were forming at the corners. I know what you mean, Debbie added. He really was a father figure to me. Remember, my dad really did die when I was young. In fact, you all may not know this, but Don used to check in on my mom, sister, and me during the year. It wasn't just a camp that he looked after us. Wow, he really sounds like a special man. He really was, Julie. He really was, Beth said. He was the reason that camp was so special. I heard that the guy that owns it now is keeping a lot of our old traditions and stuff. Some of the people I know have even been sending their daughters there. He's apparently the same kind of person as Don. He's planning a big reunion for the camp's 60th anniversary and is inviting everyone who ever attended back. It will be his 30th anniversary. I am so happy to hear that. Who remembers the song they wrote about Don for Songfest? I forget which year it was. We were little, and I forget some of the words. Before she knew it, Julie's new friends had launched into a medley of their old camp songs. Between the four of them, they were able to remember all the words to their Color War fight songs, the alma mater, and some of the novelty tribute songs that had been written for some of the favorite camp characters over the years. I think now is the perfect time to excuse myself and go to the ladies' room before I throw up. Julie pushed her chair away from the table. When she turned around, she realized that their table was one of only three or four left in the dining room. The waitstaff was pacing, anxiously awaiting their departure. She stood up and stretched. I'm running to the ladies' room. Here's a sea spot. Is that enough to cover my dinner? I bought one round in the bar. Am I good? What, are we embarrassing you? Rachel loved to antagonize people, especially when she or her company were behaving badly. Don't want to be seen with us while we're being obnoxious. No, I just really have to pee. And yes, you are being obnoxious. That word has come up more often than not since I've been with the four of you, and it fits. It really does. Boy, you are easy to rattle. Go pee, and we'll meet you outside. Rachel pulled out her wallet, threw in another $100 bill, and then took out her phone to call for an Uber. The other three women followed suit. Linda called the server over, and after glancing at the check, handed her the five crisp $100 bills. The server tried to stop the women as they half stumbled, half waddled through the restaurant. Excuse me, but I think you gave me too much. Do you want to wait for change? She asked hopefully. No, keep it, Linda called over her shoulder. She then whispered to Debbie. She probably thought we'd be cheap tippers because we were a table full of women. Debbie slowed her pace and hung back. I'll wait for Julie. Debbie stood outside the ladies' room for a few minutes, and when Julie didn't come out, she opened the door and called in. Hey, Julie, are you okay? When she got no answer, she went in. Nobody was in there, not even the attendant. She let the door swing shut as she turned to run out to the front of the restaurant. She found Beth, Rachel, and Linda talking with the valet, but no Julie. Hey, guys, we lost Julie, she said breathlessly. What do you mean we lost her? asked Beth. I mean, she wasn't in the ladies' room. Just as she finished her sentence, Julie came strolling around the far corner of the outside of the restaurant where the takeout door is. Where did you go? Debbie yelled. Took the long way home, sang Julie. It's take the long way home and not funny. We thought something happened to you. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I went back toward the kitchen. I used to know one of the sous chefs, and I wanted to say hello if he was still there. You should have told somebody. By the way, the game's over. You won already. Rachel put her opinion on the record. Oops, here's the Uber. I got shotgun. When the car pulled up to the curb outside of Joe's front entrance, there was only the one single valet attendant on the street. It was minutes before midnight and the streets were quiet. While Rachel hopped into the front of the Lincoln town car, the other four women squeezed their way into the back seat. Beth spoke up. Hey, Rachel, next time, why don't you request a minivan? This is a bit uncomfortable, especially after we just stuffed ourselves silly in there. Besides, you always seem to get that front seat. The driver spoke up. There's room up here for two ladies. This is a full bench seat here, if one of you doesn't mind sitting next to me. There was silence. He cajoled them. Come on, I won't bite, and it's not that long a ride. 
I'll move up there, Julie volunteered. Of course you will, sneered Debbie. You're sitting in the middle, so we all have to climb out. I'll do it. Debbie opened the door and climbed out and then opened the front door. She stood there in the silence as Rachel had already turned around to begin the gab fest and hadn't even noticed that Debbie was standing next to her. Ahem! She waited another few seconds and finally leaned over and flicked Rachel in the shoulder. Hey, that hurts! Rachel swung around to see Debbie standing with her hands on her hips. What was that for? You're holding up the works. Either slide over or get out so I can get in the middle. Oh, shit. Rachel pondered which would be easier for her to do, considering the ride and the conversation to follow, and eventually opted to climb out and let Debbie sit in the middle. Why is everything always a Broadway production with you? Debbie taunted. You'll be swell. You'll be great. Just get in. Rachel climbed back in, reached for the seatbelt and strapped herself in loosely, and then wiggled around again so that she was able to guide the conversation once more. Because I'm the director of this Broadway show, that's why. Now, where were we? The driver pulled away quietly and headed toward the interstate. It was late and he was already suffering from a headache, so he was in no mood to listen to a bunch of middle-aged ladies bickering. Linda picked up where she left off. So, we're going to the Vizcaya place in the morning after we find out if Julie can come, and then we'll go to the Everglades for the afternoon. Are we all on the same page here? The women all started talking at once. I'm good. Fine with me. Okay by me. Where are we going for lunch? Rachel always had to know where her next meal was going to be. Linda knew exactly who said what and responded accordingly. Rach, aren't you worried about breakfast first? Aren't you the comedian? I already ordered my breakfast through room service because I knew we were going to be out late. Ha! Huh. Rachel knew Linda was kidding her. Food had always been Rachel's passion. It wasn't always about eating the food, but more about the cooking. Rachel had been at one time a gourmet cook, and she entertained often. Her focus had changed, though. She didn't cook much anymore. Now it was more about eating, and her waistline showed it. Nobody ever went too far to tease her about it. They were good friends and would never hurt her by going past a certain point. Julie was starting to see that all these women had their breaking points. I wish I had kept my mouth shut. I've probably said hurtful things without knowing it, and now I've lied my way into having to spend the day tomorrow. I'll think of a way to get out of it. What am I talking about? There's always the ledge. The driver never spoke a word. He silently drove the empty streets back to the hotel. It seemed to Julie that the ride back was much faster than the ride to Joe's. She was feeling a bit woozy, but wasn't sure if it was from the hour, the rough turns, or from the drinking. They had been there for almost five hours and had downed five drinks. It didn't seem like that much because it was so spread out. She was, she finally decided, just plain sleepy. The Uber driver came to an abrupt stop in front of the Intercontinental Hotel exactly at midnight. When Julie glanced at her watch, she realized she had survived another day. I guess today will be the day, not yesterday. Or maybe tomorrow. Maybe I'll go with them. After all, I told myself I was going to live it up a little before I died. I only need some time to finish writing. Tomorrow night. I'll do it when we get back tomorrow night. The five women piled into the lobby. Unlike the streets outside of Joe's, the lobby at the hotel was abuzz with activity. The bar was busy and some of the shops were still open. Almost as if on cue, Julie's companions all began to yawn at the same time. It's been a long day. I'm going up to bed, Beth declared. Me too, said Debbie. Lightweights. Rachel was always ready for more. I'm spent, said Linda. Oh well, I guess it's you and me. Rachel looked hopefully over at Julie. Sorry, Rachel, I need to get some sleep, especially if I have to work in the morning. Oh, wait, I need to get at least one of your room numbers? Julie was kicking herself. She could have just forgotten to do that. She would have been off the hook. None of them knew her last name, so they wouldn't be able to find her in the morning. 11.02, offered Linda. Call me as early as you want. I'll probably be up and going by six or so. All five of the women were stepping into the empty elevator when Julie realized that if she got off on her floor, they would know where she was. Shoot, I need to check something at the desk, she quipped, as she hastily pushed her way out of the heavy mirrored doors of the elevator as they were closing. 
Night all. Good night, she heard them all sing as the doors were suctioned shut. Julie waited around by the elevator, looking up to watch the numbers climb. After about five minutes, she pushed the up button and waited for the doors to open once again, hoping that the car would be empty on her ride up. She got her wish a minute later when the elevator arrived with no other passengers and no one else waiting. As the doors opened, Julie fumbled through her purse frantically looking to find her hotel room key. She couldn't remember where she had put it. There was a time when she was ordered and organized, but lately she had been so much more impulsive and confused. Chaotic is a good word to describe my thinking. Damn it. Where the hell did I put that fucking key? Did I leave it in the room? I bet it's in the pocket of the bathrobe. No, I emptied the pockets when I found my cigarettes. Speaking of which, when's the last time I had a cigarette? Let me go back down and have one before I go to bed. Or at least before I go back to the room. Lord knows, sleep hasn't come easy. Julie pushed the down button and reached back in her purse to pull out her cigarettes. There, slipped inside the cellophane of the pack, was her room key. She shook her head, feeling the familiar self-loathing feeling. She didn't even bother to beat herself up this time. She just thought of one sarcastic word. Surprise! When she reached the ground floor, Julie headed directly to the main entrance. She walked outside and several yards to the right, where the hotel had graciously supplied a smoking station. Julie was tired of being treated like a second-class citizen simply because she was a smoker. There was no cover if it rained, no place to sit down, and no shade from the South Florida sun. I know smoking is bad for you. I'm not stupid. I've tried to quit a thousand times. I never smoke in front of family or friends. I haven't smoked in my house in 30 years. For God's sakes, what do they want from us? It would be nice if they could at least put a bus bench with a cover. She lit up her cigarette and clutched her purse under her arm, although she hadn't yet been accosted by anyone the few times she had smoked out front. In fact, nobody ever joined her when she was out there. By the pool bar, there were a lot of smokers. I wonder if the outdoor bar is even open this late. I could use a nightcap. Nah, never mind. I want to go up and write some more of the note. I haven't even really thought about it all evening. Snubbing out the butt on the side of the Smoker's World post, Julie dropped it in the hole and headed back to the entrance. Her drive to go up and write was waning. She was much readier to sleep than she had realized. She pushed the number 11 on the elevator and waited until the doors opened again. This time, she already had the key in her hand and she was ready. Nobody was in the hallway, but she didn't want to take the chance of meeting anyone, so she bounded down the hallway to her room, shoved the key in the door, and pushed her way in. Once inside, Julie leaned back against the door and let out a huge sigh. Nobody was there to hear her, yet she spoke aloud. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Hey, that would be a point, since nobody challenged me. Does that count if there's nobody here to challenge me? She pushed herself up and away from the door tossing her purse on the desk chair and dropping the room key on the desk as she breezed by. Man, how much did I have to drink? She smacked her hand on the center of the bathroom door and found herself urgently trying to unbutton her white jeans. Ugh, there is no better feeling. When Julie was finished, she kicked her jeans off and carried them into the room into the closet. I better hang these up. I have nothing else to wear if I end up going with these women tomorrow. Look at me. I'm making plans. She carefully draped them over a hanger and then dug through the tote bag that had been carelessly tossed on the floor earlier that day. There is not one clean top in here, nor is there anything clean for me to wear to sleep. I never thought I would last this long, did I? Julie pulled the tote bag over to the edge of the bed and pulled out two tops that would wear well with the white jeans and then took them into the bathroom. She filled the sink with warm water and shampoo and then rinsed the shirts, paying extra attention to the armpits and to any stains she might find. She then laid the two shirts across the vanity. Julie pulled down the hair dryer and plugged it in. I didn't take this good care of myself before I went out tonight. She laughed out loud as she dried the shirts. When they were almost completely dry, she pulled the mini ironing board down and plugged in the iron. Waiting for the iron to warm up, Julie stopped what she was doing, long enough to catch a glimpse of herself in the mirror of the bathroom. It had been a few hours since she had seen her reflection in the mirror at Joe's. Her eyes were a little red, likely from the hour and the alcohol. She was pleased, though, because it wasn't from crying tonight. 
This is the first time in a long time I've come to a midnight without tears in my eyes. She quickly touched up the two blouses and hung them in the closet with her pants. She pulled out the oversized T-shirt that she had slept in the first few nights, looked it over, and shrugged. Deciding that one more night wouldn't make the difference, she pulled off her shirt and bra, tossed them into the toad, and squirmed into the T-shirt. One more thing before I hit the hay. Just want to glance at where I left off in my letter to Morty and the fam. After brushing her teeth, she slid the laptop out of her beach bag, pushed the power button, and waited. Sitting cross-legged on the bed with the pillows crunched up behind her, she read, Hmm, I was talking about not doing much anymore, not seeing my friends much. I was talking about how maybe he was having an affair. I have a lot more to write. Maybe I'll go with those girls in the morning and then finish writing this in the afternoon. I'll see what I want to do for dinner, and then tomorrow night is the zero hour. I really need to take myself out of my misery. I really should take myself out of everyone else's misery, too.